Um, thank you all for, for joining and the chance we have over the next 45 minutes to um, reflect on what's needed, not just to have an exciting AI concept with lots of whizzy graphs and data, but actually to have something that delivers real benefits to the business. So what I want to be able to talk about and share our journey with you is going from a proof of concept to a minimal viable product to having something that is now deployed at scale and share the lessons that we've learned. And what I hope is that that will allow you to ask the right questions of collaborators, suppliers, or others that speak to you about an AI solution and give you confidence that actually you know some of the questions to ask to ensure it's not just going to look good, but will also really make a difference. The first thing I wanna do is, is set the scene a little bit by thinking about what do I mean by this proof of concept to minimal viable product journey. Anyone from a software world is familiar with this type of triangle. And what we're trying to get at here is that AI is in essence a functionality. It's necessary, but not sufficient to give you some kind of insight to know how you should act. But ultimately you need to wrap that in some kind of application that means the insight from the AI is usable by the users, can be reliably delivered, and is designed in a way that it fits into the overall IT and OT architecture that you operate in. So a minimal viable product is not just about functionality. It's also about ensuring you have this vertical slice that also considers the usability, reliability, and the overall design of the solution. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about, first of all, is a journey from a concept to an MVP. Okay, I'm going to begin by talking about the domain that we're in, then I'll describe the analytics and how it works in this journey before, before finishing off. So here, here's the domain. We're looking at sewer monitoring, and specifically, we're looking at combined sewers. For those of you who aren't from a wastewater background, this means the stormwater and the wastewater are brought into a single sewer pipe, as you can see in this image here in the top right. Most of the older cities in Europe, North America, and in some parts of Asia and the rest of the world have combined sewer systems. Ideally, we want all these to be replaced with separate sewer systems where <clears throat> the stormwater and the wastewater are in separate sewer pipes, but there's a cost to that. The challenge that, and the reason we need AI. The way a combined sewer overflow works is it takes the combined storm and wastewater to the treatment works, but at times of really high rain, there are overflow points that cause the excess volume to go into a neighboring water course, be that a river or a lake. Otherwise, it will back up and flood people's homes or escape through manholes. And it's not easy to know when there's an overflow, is that level so high because of rain or is it so high because the sewer isn't working properly? There's some kind of blockage in there. And it's unpicking that level to know the root cause for why it's high that you need AI. You can't just have a level measurement alone. You need to work out the complexities of rainfall at this particular site, is it urban or rural, hilly or flat? Or how big is the catchment area? All these things affect the way that rainfall impacts the level. And that's why you need some artificial intelligence to unpack that for you. And this is what we look to do. So here's the overall AI architecture. We're not looking at hydraulic models here. This is a data-driven approach and we're taking a measuring point within the network. That could be at a manhole or one of these overflow points. And you want to take from that a level reading. That tells you the level in the sewer. You then want to take that level reading and bring the data into the cloud. And there's multiple ways you can do that. And once it's in the cloud, you want to combine that with rainfall data. In the example I'm talking about here, the cloud infrastructure we're using is called Mindsphere, which is um, Siemens cloud resources built on AWS or Azure. Then once you've brought the level data and the rainfall data in, this is then when the AI works on that data and gives you some kind of insight. 
Okay, so it's a really technically simple architecture. So as you go through some of these complexities, imagine how much more complex it gets as you have whole network level um, things to consider. Okay, so this is um, the AI architecture simplified here. We have an artificial neural network and its job is to predict what it thinks the level should be at that measuring point. And the input into that is rainfall because that's the biggest variable for what will impact the actual level. Beyond that, you have the regular diurnal flow of what normally goes through the sewer and you have seasonality effects. So once you've got this predicted level based on the time of day, the season, the actual rainfall, you want to compare that to the actual measured level that's come from the sewer. And the way that we do that is something called a fuzzy logic system. And what this does is it first of all assesses, is there a difference between the predicted and the actual level? If there is, it wants to know how significant is that difference? And that's where it considers, is it dry or is it wet? How much does this asset normally vary? And this allows you to apply some kind of modulation to that difference, because you don't want to just flag if there's any difference. You want to know if it's a significant difference. The fuzzy logic system then outputs a classification, which we then um, use as alarm, alert, or stable for the user. That's the AI architecture. Importantly, putting that into a workflow, and this will become really important when we look at how you scale AI and build it into operations, that classification is used by an analyst to prioritize the work of operational teams that go out to these sites and they investigate for blockages. If there is a blockage, then they normally put some high pressured water down there to clear that out. Or if it's a blocked screen, then they scrape the screen and clean that. Or they might identify a collapsed sewer. There's a range of different things that they'll identify. So that's the way that the AI fits into the business as usual workflow. Let me illustrate in the proof of concept what that looked like. So here's an animation. This is proof of concept. It's not the app itself. This is early on in our journey. And what you're going to see here in the background is the classification state of the AI. In lovely pink, you've got the predicted level. Black, the measured level. And in blue, you can see the rainfall. Now here you can see there's the spill level, and actually you can see there's two actual spills and a near spill. What's important here is that the AI did not flag an alarm of any kind here. It said actually this is normal behavior, don't worry about that. But what happens here like, is after this rainfall event, something has happened that's caused a change in the baseline. And the AI has flagged this baseline. At this point here where it started to rain, it's thought actually is there a potential issue there, but no, it continues to be a challenge. Now, in some ways, this is not a very remarkable example, apart from the way it totally demonstrates why the AI is so powerful. Let's compare that to a classic threshold-based alarm in a SCADA or telemetry system. At this event here, no alarm was raised by the AI. And in rainfall events, the control room can easily be flooded by a threshold alarm raised by level sensors because they're unable to tell, is this just normal operation because the rain level is high or is this abnormal operation because there's a problem in the sewer? So the AI raised no alarms when it's green and raised alarms when it was red, whereas this threshold based alarm would have raised three alarms. In each case, there's no actual issue, and it would never have hit this raised baseline that the AI predicted, because you'd never set a threshold that low or you'd be alarming all the time. So if we were to think of this in World Cup terms, it's AI one, thresholds nil. And this is exactly the value case, which is to be able to say, you're finding genuine problems and finding them before they become a genuine issue, and that gives you time to respond so you don't have environmental incidents. You stop your sewers polluting because you've got warning and a tailored targeted notification to respond to. 
I hope that's helped everybody understand the AI. I'm going to move on now to talk about um, how that's actually scaled. But actually, just before I do it, we said that AI won threshold nil. We actually, and this is another really important point, and, and you might have experienced this. How do you know if a really fancy AI tool is real or if it's just fancy slideware and smoke and mirrors? So in this case, we invited the University of Sheffield to independently assess the power of the AI to find these issues. And they reviewed 21,000 days of data where they looked at the rainfall, the level in the sewer, the actual operational responses from Yorkshire Water, compared it to Yorkshire Water's existing system, and then looked at what the AI would have found. And that's where after evaluating all those days of data, it was shown that the AI found nine in 10 of the abnormalities in the data. And this is what gave confidence to say, let's take this from a proof of concept into a minimal viable product, something that's deployed on tens of assets and see if it can actually work in a representative environment. And that's exactly what we did. Okay, and it worked. What we're now gonna talk about though, is how you go from something that worked with a couple of people who are invested in it and excited about it and want to see if a tool works to something that's actually used as a day-to-day -day operational tool and becomes the new way of working. And this is about people changing what they do. And this is instead of just having that vertical slice, meeting all the requirements, the functional and non-functional requirements which are needed to have that as an operational tool. Let's have a look at what some of those were. The first thing that we noticed is, as we scaled this and went from looking at 70 assets to one that now looks at over 1,500 assets and is used every day, is that actually we have a larger number of personas that we need to consider needs of. And it's really important because each of those personas comes with a slightly different need. And that means there's lots of little features that can allow you to give a lot of value to those user groups, but also sometimes there are requirements they have that have to be met, particularly around IT, finance and operations that you have to get right. And that makes it becomes a slightly different challenge in terms of stakeholder management. There's also a genuine question about how you go from something that gives you monitor uh, results from 10 assets to over 1,000 assets, the thousands and thousands of assets potentially. And there's a real what's called user experience challenge there. Anyone who's worked with SCADA is familiar with the fact that you can get flooded with alarms. And as engineers, typically we love getting as much data in as we can. But unfortunately, that means it becomes unusable as a system. So one of the big changes as you scale AI is how do you make it as easy as possible for the users to get value from the insight and sift away the things that aren't necessary or package it in a way that it can be accessed, but not straight away. We've all had that experience of either using awful systems in our work life or really bad websites. This user experience engagement is really, really important and it's not trivial. It requires someone with that expertise. Another one, and this is interesting when you think about it in business as usual, is as well as looking for these pollution incidents, the analysts also need to report. That's an important part of their day-to-day -day work. Few of these systems are deployed into a vacuum. There's already existing tools. And what you don't want to go is approach a user and say, we're doubling up and increasing the number of tools that you're using. So something that allows the users to have additional features that are relatively low effort, but simplify their workday, mean that they're more likely to adopt and use the tool. What we can see here on the left is reporting functionality. And what you can see here on the right is the ability to add in jobs information. Most operational teams have some kind of combination of Excel or kind of scratch pads where they write information outside of their, their enterprise resource plan and their works management systems. What we've done is integrate that into the tool so that actually it simplifies that workflow. Again, focusing on that business as usual process. 
And I think what's significant here is these aren't about AI development. The AI kernel remains the same. But when scaling it, what's so important is you have the domain knowledge to know how you can take that insight from the AI and make it usable by the users. One of the other challenges if we now come to AI though is exploring edge cases. Typically in some kind of proof of concept or MVP, you'll focus on where the biggest value lies. And that's typically the standard normal case. But when you scale and you're selecting a tool for scale, it's really important that you evaluate the edge cases because it's in those edge cases, those ones that are less frequent but could have a very high impact if they happen, it's finding those events that you've also got to make sure that you cover. In this case, one of those was looking at instead of a radar um, or ultrasonic sensor that gives you a continuous level measurement, instead this is looking at a contact level device which instead gives you a binary signal. So some customers actually have these devices in the network and those devices still needed to be monitored and integrated in the system. An edge case, but one that if it wasn't included meant you just duplicated in total the number of tools that a user had to use. So actually that made it not a practical tool to be adopted. Here's another example now. We talked about that workflow at the beginning is the AI posts a recommendation to an analyst and then an analyst triggers an action by an operational team. When designing your scaled application, think about that end workflow and how can you then connect into other tools like enterprise resource planning or works management systems. So in this case, using a, a Siemens low code tool called Mendix, we're able to have pre-built connectors into SAP, for example, or into a range of different data lakes. And this is where that breadth of kind of end-to-end -end journey comes in again, because from an IT perspective, that persona really cares about cybersecurity. And that's a huge difference from going from playing in a hackathon to having something that now becomes a part of your day-to-day -day operation. I can't overemphasize enough how important it is to get this right. And if you do get it right, you can have confidence that you can progress with the tool. So a huge amount of work went in there to ensure that all those UK utilities can be confident in the result. Finally, one of the challenges, and I think anybody who has heard the rumors about, well, well let's use Google. So Google, for example, deprecated their IoT platform. So they created it with a great fanfare many years ago, and last year they announced that it's being closed next year. Having confidence that there's a long-term pathway and roadmap for this AI application is really important. And having some level of commercial certainty around that is also particularly important if you're dealing with startups, where the pricing model may not be based on ongoing operation, but on customer acquisition. So you need to be confident that actually, if I'm bringing this new fancy AI product into my business, it's going to be supported and it's going to be affordable in the long term. So what I've talked about there are a range of software related features. I'd like to finish off here by talking about a hardware related feature. I mentioned that kind of overall technical architecture went from a level sensor all the way up to the, the software application. To make this deployable, if we're looking at this from a whole value from the customer, how can we make it a seamless experience from when they install and commission a sensor to get the insight at the end? So now if you use a Siemens sensor, there's a Bluetooth app that you use to configure that on site. There's a button you can press that says onboard to blockage predictor. And that asset is then created automatically in the AI application. So what you're doing here is simplifying all those extra steps, cutting expensive and highly skilled IT people out of the loop, removing the risk of incorrect data entry and reducing the time it takes for the AI to be able to start working on that data. Another innovation that we've done here is we've also generalized the AI model so you no longer need training data. If I'm to, to, to summarize this now and look at what impact did all these innovations have as we went from an MVP to scale, the AI kernel, as I said, remained the same, but it then became about integrating this and embedding this into daily operations. After evaluating a thousand assets in daily operation for a month, 
what Yorkshire Water found is that they found 24% more blockages and 65% of them they detected earlier than they would have using their existing statistical system. And what's really important is they didn't have to, they had no increase in the total number of alarms that they were managing. This meant in effect, one analyst was now able to actively manage 30 times more assets than they were before. And that's what makes the AI scalable. I'm going to end this year. So just to conclude with some, some final thoughts there, there's a huge gap to go from an MVP to having something deployed in operations. Think about that pyramid and those things that are not just about the AI. I haven't talked too much about the culture and people aspect, but that's going to be central to helping those users feel comfortable with the AI, how it fits into the workflow, because ultimately you're changing what they do every day and making them even better. Thank you very much. I hope that you found that useful and I'm open to some questions. So if you have any question to Dr. Cartwright, just unmute yourself, maybe turn on your video if you want and you can ask him. I see a question in the chat uh, by Mr. Jürgen Schmidtke. Um, is there an example in Germany he's asking? Maybe you would like to expand on your question as well. Uh, maybe personally, you are invited to do so. Hello, Jürgen. Um, yeah, ha happy to have a. Ooh, I've gone all blurry. Look at that. It's very, it's very dark in my room. I think that the, the sun started to set while while I've been speaking outside. Um, there isn't an example of deployment yet in Germany. Um, it is one of those things that we are looking to take outside of the UK in the new year. So in 2023, we have our first project outside of the UK in, uh, in Greece, which is starting at the moment. Um, but we'd be really keen to work with anybody who'd be interested to to deploy it in Germany or elsewhere. Do you have any specifics in mind, uh, Jürgen? Um, what one other observation I'd make, and this is again around edge cases, is the core use case here is around combined sewer systems. But there's some an, an applicable capability which can equally apply to separated sewer systems, where you're looking for inflow and ingress. Separated systems in many ways are a simpler use case because rainfall is complex. You don't know when it's going to fall. You don't know how intense it's going to be. Whereas in a separated system, in theory, you just have that fixed diurnal pattern and occasional events from heavy users. So it should be far simpler to identify abnormalities. So while what we have here is a system that works on combined sewers, um, one of the use cases that we're looking to test, if there's anybody be interested in that, is the applicability on separated systems. We know it works in theory, but we'd like to test it on some real data on um, yeah, on, on a real network. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, I'm looking again in the direction of the audience. Maybe there will be some more questions. Uh, this is your chance. One question. Uh, is from Mr. Uh, Zhang. How long have you been researching? Oh, that, that, that's an interesting <laughs> question. So um, the first AI concept for how this could be monitored was actually published uh, by the University of Sheffield and Yorkshire Water in 2015. And by 2018, they had a system that worked and it had been created by university researchers. But the problem was it wasn't usable, it wasn't scalable, and it wasn't secure. It was built in MATLAB, for those of you who know what MATLAB is. And so it didn't end up going anywhere. And this is a classic example of the problem of scaling AI. What stopped Yorkshire Water adopting the tool was not the cleverness of the AI, it was actually all those things that made it deployable in operations. So what we did as Siemens is we collaborated with Yorkshire Water to take that initial AI concept and we built on that and we rounded it out into all those other things that are needed to make it actually operationally useful. So we started working with Yorkshire Water on this in um, the end of 2019. In 2020, the MVP was completed. They made the decision in 2021 to go to scale and the scale deployment across now nearly 2,000 assets was completed in 2022. 
Um, I would like to ask a question, Regina Knirs. Hi. Hi. Um, I enjoyed your lecture very, very uh, much and uh, thanks a lot. I would like to know how uh, many sensors uh, were uh, uh, included in your AI and how reliable they were, because I consider that you have to identify the blockage and in in uh, UK you often have blockage with uh, fatigue in the mm -hmm. sewers. Okay, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so there's one measuring point per combined sewer overflow. The system also works on manholes in sewers as well. So uh, along the, the, the length of the, the, the sewer itself. So we have 2000 measuring points, which we're monitoring. Data quality is a massive issue. And that's because the sensors are in a fairly harsh environment. And one of the biggest influences on the sensor quality is actually how it's installed and the telemetry. So sometimes things rag up on the sensors. Sometimes they aren't installed in quite the right place. And one of the things we've had to build into the app, and here's another example of it's not AI, but it's how you go from MVP to scale, is how we build in data quality checkers. So what we're looking for is stuck values. We're looking for oscillations. We're looking for physically impossible values, and we're looking for very um, physically impossible spikes. So all these things then help and missing data. So, and all these things help you then identify if you can trust the value. Now, there's one final thing um, on this, and I, I would say this because Siemens is a fantastic supplier of level instruments, is that most water companies only take the process variable from the instrument. And there's actually a lot of rich data in the sensor. And one of those is echo confidence. So on a radar or an ultrasonic, that gives you a level of confidence that the reading that's being chosen is actually likely to be accurate. Sometimes if you've got lots of echoes from benching or things in a sewer, or then actually sometimes um, the, the, the sensor chooses the wrong value and you get this oscillation of data. So we can also bring back that echo confidence data so you can cross check the software based data quality checkers with the sensor given data quality measurement and that's all there in the app yeah okay thanks so i think we have to talk later on <laughs> okay <laughs> thanks should say that the UK at the moment is rolling out huge numbers of sensors into the sewer network because it's been identified there's some particular challenges around river pollution. And what's been interesting is there's been a bit of a maturing, and I think this is interesting with the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive consultation that's come out. So it was required of the UK water companies to put sensors on all these overflow points to count the number of spills and what's happened is the public have suddenly gone that's a huge number of spills far more than we ever expected we didn't know this was happening why is it happening and why aren't you stopping it so having a huge amount of data to start with didn't help the water companies it's just given a huge amount of data without context to the public and that's then made this into a huge issue. This is frontline news. Water companies have been fined in the UK hundreds of millions of pounds in total over the last three years from the way they haven't been monitoring these overflows. And I think there's an interest in learning for Europe as you look at greater monitoring through the um, consultation and the directive, which is to say, how do you learn from the lessons in the UK and recognize in just having loads of data might not be reassuring, but might cause more people to worry and you need to help them have the context around that data when you share it with them so there's another question in the chat from Markus hoffmann Adding to uh, Regina Gnir's previ uh, previous question, what are the associated costs 
of the sensors used and how do they compare to the total cost of the project? Oh, that's another really, really good question. Um, so I mentioned in there that the, the cost of the application itself, the application is a software as a service model. Um, so you pay for it annually and that's five, on average, five euros per asset per month. And that's flexible. You, you, you buy that in little bits and you, and you build it up to however many you want to monitor. But that's just the software. If you're buying this as an integrated solution, an important decision to make is around the quality of the sensor that you want. Now, Siemens supplies awesome high quality sensors, so I am going to say this. So, But it's because we supply these sensors that we actually looked into it in greater detail. What we... What we looked at is the total cost of ownership of a sensor. We have an integrated sensor with a telemetry unit, which then sends that data all the way into the cloud, as I mentioned. I don't know what the cost point is in other places in Europe, so I'm reticent to say that because I don't know how Siemens prices that. But what I would say is what's really important is when you install it, you reduce the likelihood of someone having to go back to revisit it. So sometimes in the UK, nearly 20% of installs need to be revisited within the first three months because they weren't installed quite right. And that's not found out until someone tries to do something with the data later. The second thing is then how you ensure it's easy to replace. Because what we found is if confined space entry is required, that gets really expensive. So we need a sensor that doesn't require that and can go at the top of the chamber. You also need something that is really easy to swap out so you can minimize traffic measures. So I'm afraid I can't give you prices around sensors and telemetry units. I'd be happy to pick that up with you afterwards, but I'd say if overall consider the total cost. So the time it takes to install, do you need confined space entry? How likely is it to have an error when you install and actually think about the cost of maintenance, including things like traffic calming? Because all those things add up to far more than the cost of the sensor and saving 20 euros on a sensor, for example. Does that answer the question? Yes, it did. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, then. I wish you all a nice blue planet. And thanks for participating. Thank you, Dr. Cartwright. No problem. Thank you, everybody.